Let's open our Bibles to the end. Go to Revelation 22. This morning we're looking at the stark choices, I call it. Uh, Basically, what we're going to see in a little bit when we get to Revelation 9 is what is going on right now, what has always gone on, and what is really beautifully illustrated in the book of Revelation, and that is the choice between Christ who offers life. Jesus said, you come to me, and I'll give you life, and not just life barely making, I'll give you life that's more abundant. He talked about it as an overflowing life. In fact, the writer of Hebrews calls it an endless life. We live every day after the power of an endless life. That's what Christ offers. Satan, on the other hand, and as you see on the screen, and all of his minions, the demons, and this confined, high-level demon called the destroyer, Satan came to kill and steal and destroy, John 10.10. And he offers endless death. And so the, the, the offers, I mean, what's real neat is there's no middle ground. Either you receive by faith Christ's offer of endless life, or by refusal or neglect, you default to endless death. There, there is no waiting room purgatory where you can kind of get purged from whatever mistakes you made. Either you're absolutely forgiven and become a saint while you're breathing on earth or you endlessly pay your own debt of sin forever with the devil and his angels. That's, that's how the Bible is postured all the way through. It's very clear. Jesus said two gates, two roads, two entrances, two destinations, two banks, Two types of people. I mean, Jesus was very clear-cut. We like the third because it's too hard. So we want a blurry middle. Jesus said, nope, it's, it's one or the other. Either you have me or you don't. At this moment, sitting here, this morning, there are no people that are on their journey toward Christ. Either you're saved or you're lost right now. And that's why he calls it the new birth. That's why he calls it this, this relationship that begins. A relationship begins at an instant. There is a beginning to everything, and salvation begins in a life at what's called the new birth, being saved, being born again, being converted. That's the choice. So this book is fascinating, and it's built around this invitation from God. But why am I saying all this? Because I have personally about 150 different works on the book of Revelation. These are authors. Some of them are from what are called the post-apostolic fathers and the apostolic fathers, all the way through to modern-day people that are alive and teaching the Bible. And in those 150 different treatments, almost all of them agree that Revelation 9 is probably one of the most difficult chapters in the Bible. In fact, when I was studying in California, I used to, Bonnie would uh, graciously drive me to Pasadena, drop me off in front of those ivy-covered walls of Fuller Seminary, and I didn't go there for the theology, and I didn't attend there, because it's a very liberal place, and they don't hold to the uh, sufficiency of the Scripture or the authority of the Scripture and a lot of other things. But Fuller Seminary houses in the deepest basement of their library Wilbur M. Smith's library. He had 25,000 books. He was a, uh, about 50, 60 years ago, one of the renowned Bible scholars in America. And he read all those books. And he didn't just read them, he underlined them, and he made notations in this beautiful fountain pen. I feel like I've known him because I've read so many of his books. He read all 25,000 of them, and Daisy Chain linked all the topics in them with his fountain pen notations. And so you're reading over in this stack, and it says, wow, and the treatment on this is over in this book. And so you run to this stack, and there in the same handwriting, He's, you know, written notes in in this book. And I used to spend all of my allowance that I had as a newlywed over Xeroxing pages out of his books. And you know what he said about this chapter that we're going to? He said, I've read 25,000 books. I can't understand chapter 9. He said, it's too difficult. That's where we're headed to chapter 9. But to help us understand, because God actually built a framework around it, What we see, if we step back, is one of the most amazing features of the book of Revelation. See, before you try and understand chapter 9 and try and make every uh, women's hair-faced locust that looks like a horse into something, a helicopter or something, which is what most people do. I've read their treatments. It's like everything has to be something today. You know, oh, you know, that's that's an Apache helicopter. Oh, I don't think so. I think it's a a locust, you know. God said it was a locust, you know, so it is probably. But before you dive into that, if you back up 
Revelation chapter 22, look at verse 16, contains one of the most beautiful invitations to the gospel in the whole Bible. And if we understand that, the Bible closes with one of the greatest invitations ever to be written down. It's in this final chapter in the last book of the Bible. So before the horrors of chapter 9, listen to the offer of endless life. Because, see, you can't understand chapter 9 unless you put around it the framework of what it is God is even doing. What he's been doing since Genesis chapter 3, when God came looking for Adam and Eve. He didn't wait until they were, you know, just totally ravaged by sin and finally they would look for him. He looked for them. He initiated. See, uh, God initiates salvation. Jonah 2.9 says salvation is of the Lord. It comes from God. He came looking. If you're saved this morning, God was looking for you long before you were looking for him. That's what the Bible says. But now back up and put that truth that you all know over the book of Revelation. God is telling us something. The backdrop is all the horror of Revelation, but the frame is the gospel and the God who wants to share the gospel. So just follow along in your Bibles. The, the, the standing up part is in a while and it's a long piece, so I want you to rest as much as possible. We're going to read the whole ninth chapter, which I bet has never been done in public for most of you in your whole life because it's so scary. But uh, look at verse 16. Look who is speaking here. Jesus Christ is talking to anyone who listens. He says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel, Angelos, messenger, to testify to you these things in the churches. So what Jesus is saying, now, your Bible, the last book, the revelation was to be testified in all the churches of Christ. Now, I've told you this, and I'm not going to bore you with it, but it was. Revelation is the most preached about book in the Bible in the early centuries of the church. If you clipped up every sermon that, that men preached and were recorded and clipped out just the passages they read in their sermons, the only book of the Bible you can reproduce every word of is the book of Revelation. They did this. They testified because they saw this message that the book of Revelation is all about getting the church, giving the gospel, seeing what's coming and where they fit in the whole process and obeying the one who is the God who is our Savior. Well, keep reading. I am the root, Jesus says. He's continuing to introduce himself, the one who's speaking. I am the root and the offspring of David. I am the bright and morning star. And the spirit and the bride, verse 17, say, come. And let him who hears say, come. And let him who thirsts, come. Now look at this invitation. Whoever desires, let him take of the water of life freely. Now remember, we're reading about all the waters polluted. Remember last week? A third of all fresh water, a third of all the ocean life, plankton and all phytoplankton, everything is, is, is killed in, in these rapid succession disaster plagues that come. And the Lord says, you're thirsty? Is this is getting your attention? If you've tried everything, if you've, if you've overdosed on sin and still you have to increase the dosage of sin and the, the satisfaction and pleasure level keeps going down and down, and by the way, it will keep going down and down. It's a higher investment for a lower return the longer you sin. Jesus said, if you're getting tired of that, look at the end, verse 17. Whoever desires, let him come and take the water of life freely. What is that? The water of life? He said, out of you will flow rivers of living water. You'll never be thirsty again. You'll never hunger. You never run dry. You're never dissatisfied and, and hopeless and aimless and purposeless. Yeah, you know, I was just reading the news. In my, if, if I uh, didn't live here, I would live in Jerusalem. I mean, that's where I love Jerusalem. So I read the news there like I live there. And you know what happened there this week? A father and mother from Russia that emigrated, Jews came, and the dad worked too much, and the mother's divorcing him. So he went over and knocked out the mom, grabbed the two little kids, went to the 11th floor apartment where they live, and threw them both out the window and jumped behind them. He said, if I can't be married to her and have a family, we're all going to die. And they committed suicide. See, that's the level people come to as sin becomes unmaintainable 
and any delights and joys in life evaporate. And what does God say? He says, if you desire to have your life the way I want it to be, the way your creator designed it to be, come to me. Drink me. Personally receive me. And I will give you the water of life. Well, if we were having a, um, a Bible study where we were sitting around talking, uh, kind of what the early church was like. They met in homes and they discussed. And we talked through this. This great invitation is filled with some powerful truths. And if we were listing the truths, kind of the devotional Bible study method, the 2 by 12 and 12 by 12 method we've covered for a few years here, here's what we'd say. Jesus sent the content to the book of Revelation. You understand that? None of this is science fiction. None of this is Tolkien or Spielberg or, you know, uh, George Lucas or whoever. This is not a video game. Jesus sent this. I, Jesus, it's, look at verse 16 on the screen. I sent my angel to testify to you these things. This is five verses before the end of the book. He says, this whole book I sent for the churches. And I, and I want you to know that. And then Jesus says, I'm very unique. I am the root of David. Now, just do a little mental thing here. David, root, is something that something grows from. So David is growing from something that's his root. And Jesus said, it's me. You say, oh, that's interesting, except that's an anachronism. What does that mean? It doesn't fit chronologically. When did Jesus live? A thousand years in his human life after David. So everybody that read this had to understand Jesus was saying, I'm very unique. Before I came to earth as a baby, I was the infinite God, the second person. I am God incarnate a thousand years after David, but before my incarnation, I was the root of David. I'm his creator. I'm the one that invented humanity, created humanity, chose Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and David to be sitting on my throne. So Jesus said, I'm very unique. I'm, I'm also the offspring of David. I'm the promised Messiah, the one that, that it talks about in Psalm 2 that's going to come and rule with a rod of iron on this earth and the throne of David. He said, that's me. And I'm the bright and morning star. I'm the one who offers salvation to anyone. And see, that's the backdrop of Revelation. And you can't understand chapter 9. And, and, and chapter 9 is really the hardest chapter to understand. And, and basically, the easiest way to understand it is don't try and make everything something. Don't allegorize it and don't spiritualize it. Just, just say John saw it, and God said it's going to happen, and, and read it like you would the menu in common, simple English. And if God said locusts come out of the pit, they come out. And if God said there's a pit by the Euphrates, there is. And, and that's the, the, the lessons of chapter 9 are incomprehensible without the framework of this gospel invitation. And so the Lord offers salvation. And the Bible closes with one of the greatest invitations of all, an amazing offer of endless life given by God the Father, Son, and Spirit. I mean, look down. It says, the Spirit and the bride say, come, and let him that is a thirst. Who sent Revelation? The first chapter says God sent it. Who offered himself? Jesus. And now the Spirit says, come. All three members of the Trinity are involved in this gospel blitz and this offer of salvation. And that's what's found in the final chapter of the last book of the Bible. Now, turn back with me to what's perhaps one of the most vivid, uh, horrific chapters in the Bible. I mean, this, this would make one of the a good low-budget horror film that they make all their money on because it's just what those kind of people like to see. Revelation 9, and our theme this morning as we read this is the amazing contrast that God gives, I call them stark choices, between Christ who offers endless life, the devil, the destroyer from the abyss, who offers endless death. Now who even thinks that's a choice? I mean honestly, sitting here this morning. Who would think that's even a choice? Endless death and horror and, and creatures that are so horribly fiendish that God has to keep them locked up in kind of the greatest maximum security prison in the universe and, and going to live there forever with them, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire and the blackness of darkness in a bottomless pit. Who would want that when you can have 
fellowship with the God of the universe. I mean, it's not even a choice, but it is a choice. And many people don't even make the right choice. Well, chapter 9, are you there? Let's all stand for our longest reading, I think, ever. Chapter 9, you follow along, and then I'll pray. And let's just, as we read, let the Lord speak to our hearts, because this chapter is a gold mine of truth that helps us understand the heart of God and the gospel and his plan for this world. Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. Then out of the smoke locusts came upon the earth. And to them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their forehead. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold, and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair, and their teeth were like the lion's teeth, and they had breastplates like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. One woe is past. Behold, two still more woes are coming after these things. Then the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying, To the sixth angel who had the trumpet, release the four angels who are bound at the great river Euphrates. So the four angels, who had been prepared for the hour and day and month and year, were released to kill a third of mankind. Now, the number of the army of the horsemen was 200 million. I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision. Those who sat on them had breastplates of fiery red, hyacinth blue, and sulfur yellow. And the heads of the horses were like the heads of lions. And out of their mouths came fire, smoke, and brimstone. By these three plagues... A third of mankind was killed by the fire and the smoke and the brimstone which came out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails are like serpents, having heads, and with them they do harm. But the rest of mankind, who were not killed by these plagues, did not repent." of the works of their hands, that they should not worship demons and idols of gold, silver, brass, stone, and wood, which can neither see nor hear nor walk. And they did not repent of their murders or their sorceries or their sexual immorality or their thefts. Wow. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Thank you, Father, for... Lord Jesus, sending us this. Thank you for telling us this is to be testified in the churches. And thank you that, that in your plan, this is a motivation for us to give the gospel, to live the gospel, to share the gospel, to win and witness and disciple and nurture people into your kingdom. And Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding and that we would know you better and follow you more closely and Avoid some of the contagions, especially those that are attached to demons, 
that are increasingly around us even today. And we ask all that as we dive into your word today in the name of Jesus and for his glory. Amen. You may be seated. As you're seated, before we try and unpack at 21 verses, and we're going to cover all of them this morning. Remember where we started. Remember, Jesus sent his messenger to testify to you these things in the churches. You see, this letter came dictated by Christ, written down by John, mailed to the churches in, in Asia to have their messenger, the one who was the, the teaching pastor, testify these things to the church. You understand, we're doing the same thing that's been done for 20 centuries. And so what that means is the events we're looking at in Revelation are God's truth. These are not fictional. I mean, we're living in an age where people are having trouble, especially the younger they are. I don't know what generation we're on, X, Y, Z, or we're back to A again. But we're in a generation that has been completely bathed in electromagnetic radiation, Wi-Fi, the Internet, cyberspace. I mean, it's just like it's seamless. I mean, they can't make a car without flip-down screens because we wouldn't want to talk in the car. We all have to be watching something. And, you know, you've got to have your device with you, and you've got to be constantly either playing or watching or listening. And that's why the Lord says there's something about being still to know he's God. And there's something about quietness, that in quietness and confidence we find our strength. But we're living in this cyber-bathed and electronic digital uh, world where it all kind of blends together. Our minds can hold six quadrillion video clips. I mean, there are 600 octillion synaptic connections in the brain which can record precisely Everything. I mean, we have a video camera with an audio recorder with magnification and, and zoom lens running all the time. And so everything that we're smelling, hearing, seeing, thinking, watching, uh, distractedly in the background is all being recorded. And the problem now we have is that we get little children here, and they're in Sunday school, and the teacher says, we're going to talk about Moses. They go, oh, I know about Moses and Moses and the, the prince of Egypt. Yeah. And they don't know that Disney wrote that. And it has really very little correspondence to the Bible. But that's what they know. They've watched it 50 times, you know, in the car, strapped in, like that. And, and so their worlds are, what I'm trying to say is, most people's lives are not grounded in truth. In fact, this is boring to most people. Incomprehensible to the lost. Boring to Christians oversaturated with the spirit of this age. And they can't hear it. And it's muffled. And it's just, it's like you're trying to listen to, you know, your out of range station and it gets fainter and fainter and finally you can't hear it. Well, what we're looking at this morning is not fiction. It's truth. And, and one of the first things, let me just show you a few things. Truth can be far more fascinating than fiction. So much of our entertainment today of all forms centers around fiction because reality to most people in their workaday world is mundane and boring. And as we get to Revelation 9, there is nothing left that's mundane or boring. It evaporates. Just to stay alive by Revelation 9 takes much of most people's efforts. If you retrace what we've done in 6, 7, and 8, just think about this. Just breathing will be hard as most of the world will have some form of respiratory damage from the smoke, the ash, and the violent weather changes that have already gone on in chapter 6 and 8. But they've survived all that with their, you know, uh, disorders to their lungs. It's like everybody will have staged something of asthma. And then they have water deprivation, food scarcity, constant sights of death and destruction, and that becomes familiar. It becomes the new normal. That is, until the survivors come to this chapter. Now, those fractions for you are, are basically for you to think about. God has already told us that one-fourth of humanity has perished. That's Revelation 6, 8. That's before God got involved. All the Lord did is subtract a few things. He took out the vibrant witness of born-again believers in the workforce in the everyday life of this world. The ones that say, 
no, I don't think, no, God, God has talked about the sanctity of life. No, God has talked about homosexuality. No, no, God does talk about how creation, and no, no, God says murder is wrong. No, no, no. This, it's always, there are no situational ethics. God has spoken his word. And so all of those naysayers that always are impeding culture are pulled out. Then the pillar and ground of truth the church that you're sitting in today and all across this world that stands for truth, that broadcasts truth, that preaches truth, that dispenses truth, that teaches truth, that's removed. But it says in 2 Thessalonians 2 that the restrainer, that the restraint of the Spirit of God, the, there's restraint going on all around us. The Spirit of God is restraining, in fact, He's incarcerating the worst of the worst of the demons, not letting them out. There's so much evil that they would foment. But God just pulls back the control rods in chapter 6. And by verse 8, a fourth of all the people have murdered and killed and, and slaughtered each other just in the beginning. But, but now look at that other fraction, the one-third. That's chapter 9, verse 18. And by chapter 9, verse 18, one-third more will perish. And if you add 25 plus 33 percent, that makes 58, just shy of almost two-thirds of the planet gone, of the people. Amazing to think about. That means death is staggeringly common. But life this side of hell will never get as unpleasant as we see it become in chapter 9. Because what happens is, God shows us his purpose. By the way, what would be the purpose of this bleak, stark, horrific record about the future? That's why all of these commentators, they're trying to make it something in the past. And they're trying to think, ah, this is the Black Plague in London. No, no, this is when the Ganges flooded. No, it's the Yellow River when a million Chinese pair. No, no. This is the great Gobi sandstorm. And they're just, they're always trying to make everything something that's in the past. But God said this is in the future. This is future. Because what comes from this is the end. And it hasn't ended yet. In the Gobi or the Ganges or wherever. This is future. And that's how the whole book is postured. So, what the Lord is telling us is this. He's showing us a contrast between two stark choices, between Christ and Satan. Now remember, Jesus, that's what his ministry was. He was always calling people to choose. Well, let's just walk through this chapter and see how God, who has always offered humans a way out of their sin, here again does the same. And as we see by the time we get to verse 20 and 21, humans still refuse. Even when God gives them literally a taste of hell. What we're going to see as we track through this is that God freezes, he kind of puts on pause, death. Now remember, he's in charge of death. No one dies a moment before or a moment after. God wants them. They have appointments. We all have appointments with death. You can't escape it. You can't uh, speed it up, and you can't hold it off, you know, by a few more, you know, carrot juices. No. It, it, it's appointed unto us to die. But for five months, God freezes death, and he puts it on pause just before, over in the Middle East, where all the other problems are, gushing up like a volcano by the Euphrates River, becomes this furnace of smoke, and it just gushes so much that it makes the whole world darken and, and be coughing from this sulfur-laden smoke. And as everybody has got their, you know, their iPhone 5CS or whatever we're on tuned in, they're watching the smoke. And out of the smoke come locusts. But they're like horses. Now that is going to be a sight for the world to see. And they start causing stings like scorpions. Have you ever seen someone stung by a scorpion? They convulse, they writhe, and they act much like most of the demonized people that were thrown at Christ's feet acted. Writhing, throwing themselves into the fire, throwing themselves in the water. Why? They wanted to kill themselves. They were in such torment. The whole world starts convulsing and writhing, 
as demons sting them. And you know what's happening? The whole world gets a taste of hell. God lets the the occupants of hell out. He lets the smoke and the fiery furnace of hell out. He lets the creatures that are most associated with hell loose. And he doesn't let anybody die for five months. No suicides. No, I mean, everybody's cancer is abated for five months. No one dies. Why? I mean, why would God, I mean, why would he torture people for five months, inflict hurt on them? Because he's saying, this is going to be over in five months. That's never over. You understand? That's a stark contrast. That's a God who is a savior saying, will you repent before that? I'm giving you a taste, a sampler of hell. And the majority of the people won't. They start worshiping the very things that are inflicting their pain, the demons. They worship the demons, not the creator. Okay, let's walk through the chapter or we'll never go home. Uh, Number one, we're going to learn lessons from the demons' locations. Where are they? Where is this pit? Uh, How does God launch them? I just told you about this, this fountain. And by the way, don't get, you know, any tremors trying to write this down. We're going to be here a long time, okay? This is quite a big chapter. What do they look like? Why does God describe them with all those like, 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 likes? Did you notice that? Who is their leader? Who is this, this powerful destroyer? You know, I looked. There's a video game online. It's called something like War craft or something because I was studying uh, Apollyon and the Destroyer and he's a character in that movie. You know what? He's going to come out and people are going to try and hit the off button and he doesn't go off. He's real. And it's interesting who he is and the terrifying power they have to convulse people and inflict horrible pain and then death. People will cry. They think death is a cessation. Death is just the beginning of the pain. And then the chapter ends with the most sobering part. Sin is so powerful in its hardening ability to our souls, deadening to our spirits, that people that see God himself with his arms out sending angels, 144,000 witnesses, two witnesses, and, and all these disasters, and he's standing up there over the cloud of smoke with his arms out saying, you don't have to go there, come to me, come to me, the water of life's free, come to me. People refuse and say, I'd rather be in that pit than in your arms. That's amazing. Okay, now if we were sitting around talking about this, these are some of the questions. Uh, Who's this fifth angel? Why does he sound? And who's the star that falls from heaven? By the way, it's a person because the next words say he was given the key. And is this in the Bible anywhere? Did Jesus ever say, I saw someone fall like fire or lightning from heaven? And who, by the way, has the keys to the bottomless pit? And besides that, what is the bottomless pit? It must be there now if it's open then. And did anybody in Christ's time, like a demon, ever refer to that place and talk about it? All the time. Every time Jesus cast a demon out, they go, don't, don't put me in the abyss, don't put me down there, don't send me yet. I mean, they don't even want to go there. That's, if, for anybody that thinks they're going to earn their way to heaven and refuses God's way, you ought to listen to a demon then. The demons don't even want to go there. It's that bad. It's that real. And what is all this smoke of a great furnace? This comes up in all of Christ's parables. He talked twice as much about this as he did heaven. He's always talking about fire and and consumed by the fire and the vengeance of fire. And then when you get, see, that's only the first two verses, how many thoughts come to our mind. And why are those creatures in the form of locusts? And what kind of creatures are they? And where could they come from? And you're talking to the person who designed a universe that we can't even fathom. We don't even know. They figure, there there are so many species we haven't even discovered here. And we've got everybody's brains working on it and all the research money. Can you imagine how many creatures we don't even know about? And these are obviously some of them, but they are demonized. Uh, And why are they compared to scorpions three times? And, And how come locusts only eat plants and trees, but these don't? And, and what is this seal of God? Boy, if I didn't have it, I'd want it. Because you don't get those monsters. 
In fact, last week in the visitor line, I, I, I meet everybody and we're shaking hands and someone took my hand. And, you know, I was kind of thinking about the one I just passed off and I was looking at the rest of them down this way. And I was just starting to hear what they were saying and they said, boy, you really scared me. Is that going to happen to me? That was last week. I wonder what they're going to say this week. And I, I hadn't looked at them yet and I was starting to calmly say, no, it won't happen because it doesn't happen to believers. And I thought they might not be a believer. I mean, because they were horrified by chapter 8. Well, chapter 9, make sure you have the seal of God on your forehead. And why torment and not kill for five months? And why is it the fifth trumpet in five months? And, and by the way, that's the whole life cycle of locusts, the five-month cycle of them going from their stages. But, and God prevents death for five months. That's fascinating. And now we get into, you talk about, this is what Wilbur Smith said you can't even understand. How can a locust be shaped like a horse? And why does God say like? And how come these, they're like prepared for battle and they like crowns of gold, but their faces are like men's faces, but their hairs are like women's hair, but their teeth are like lions, and they're wearing iron, but they sound like chariots and horses, but their tails are like scorpions. And why again, the second time, does God allow them to hurt people? And then, Immediately we wonder, who's the king over this horde of incarcerated monsters? And, and what's the significance of his name? And by the way, who did Jesus say came to kill and steal and destroy? And how are these three woes different than the previous four? And why are some angels, are they in hierarchies? I mean, uh, why would God even bring these details that are so gruesome up? And why would he say the church is supposed to know this? That's, why is this supposed to be testified to us? and all through the centuries. And what would the message of five months of hell on earth mean to humans? Other than God is a God who has his arms of salvation open and he wants them to hear. And now we're getting into even more. How come the altar in front of God is talking and what is it for and what is it saying and what does it stand for and why is it there and why are those four angels bound? And are any angels bound now? In 2013, does the Bible even talk about that? If so, why did they get bound? And that's really fascinating. You know, we have clinics and the stars go in and out of them. They're called sexual addiction clinics. And I forget the guy, the two and a half men guy. I don't even know his name. Sheen, I think. You know, he's got all these sexual addictions and, you know, everyone, it's kind of laughable. And did you know demons are drawn to sexual things? Did you know it's Peter says that there are a whole group of demons God incarcerated because they are sexual predators and offenders? I mean, the Bible actually says that. We didn't invent the term. God already has incarcerated some of these beings. Did you know demons are also like flies? Leave out your dinner from tonight. Leave it out long enough. I don't know where they come from. They come out of the woodwork. I don't know. But you will have flies starting to creep under the screens of your house to get, they are drawn to decay. Demons are drawn to specific sins. They're, they're especially like flies drawn to sexual immorality. Isn't that interesting that Satan has now caused the Motion Picture Association of America to keep receding the ratings? What in the 50s would have been classified as X became R in the 60s and 70s and 80s, and then it became PG-13 in the 90s. And now, everyone is comfortable in our world watching partial nudity, which is an oxymoron. Either there's nudity or there's not. But that's even our relativistic society. It's partial, which is code for it's okay. But what they don't know is, remember I told you at the beginning, we've got this supercomputer that is recording everything we see here and even the background and our feelings and all of our senses, even smell is attached to it. And that thing can run our entire lifetime and nothing is lost, except when you have a test, it's lost. But all the other times it's there. And it's all in our spiritual being, everything we've seen and heard and watched and watched with only one eye and turned away from and looked back at, it's all there. And the garbage that's there draws these creatures. They infest immorality, they infest 
social sins of relational bitterness and anger and wrath. They love gossip. They inflame it. These creatures are spiritual beings that interact with humans. And it's very interesting that we're living in a time when, as long as you put a kind of a cute romantic story with the occultic underlying thing, every girl in the country will flock to see demonic werewolf men that turn into handsome guys that are so loving boyfriends. And our conditioning is allowing the occult around us to negate. And so that's why they get bound and some get released and why is it Euphrates? And now we're not even at the end. Why did God prepare this a long time ago? Why are there 200 million? Are these angels or demons? I mean animals or demons? Why do they look so fearsome, kind of matching our video games? And how many is a third of population today? It's 2.3 billion. All at once. Is there a correlation between fire, smoke, and brimstone kind of hell and the bite of a serpent kind of Satan? That's a neat tie. And why do some survive if they are, these are supernatural monsters? Why don't they kill everybody? And what does God say is behind every idol? It actually says that in verse 20. Every idol around this world has behind it a demon. And demons are behind those idols. Those little Shinto shrines, those little Buddha, every idol, the millions of India, every idol, there are a lot of demons. And they're active. Why would humans turn to idols when God is so vivid all through the world? I mean, he's sending meteorites, he's dimming the sun, and he's sending this volcano of smoke that locusts come out of. And how are demons worshipped today? Hmm, sensuality, relational problems, pride, the occult theme in so many movies, beyond all the Ouija boards and tarot cards and seances. And why does God use the repent word twice? Well, basically this, and what we're going to see is, and you can close your Bibles and be headed toward your green books because we're going to end by singing the chorus in here. But let me just tell you this as you're turning there. God actually is such a savior that he gives mankind five months of hell on earth. And the whole time, he's got the gospel blimp going of the angel. He's got the 144,000 going to person to person. He's got the two witnesses there. And God's arms are out. And he says, that's where you're headed. But this is who I am. I want you to experience the marvelous grace of your loving God. And that's the message of Revelation 9. And that's the gospel that we believe and are supposed to be sharing with people around us. So, number 201, if you'll open there with me. And what we're going to do is, uh, as soon as you find it, let's stand because we're done. And so, stand with your hymn book. And we're going to just read the first verse. I want you to go out not thinking about horse-sized, lion-teethed, monsters. But I want you to think of why God sent them, and it's because of this. And let's read it. Marvelous grace of our loving God, grace that exceeds our sin and our guilt. Yonder on Calvary's mount outpoured, there where the blood of the Lamb was spilled. Father in heaven, I thank you for the marvelous, infinite, matchless grace freely bestowed even this moment on all who believe. You who are longing to see his face, will you this moment his grace receive? Oh, you are a savior, dear God. You are offering salvation to the last moments in this book, and you're offering it right now. And I pray even today, if there's someone here that's part of the group that has not the Son, that has never been born again, that has never personally called out to you, confess with their mouth that you are Savior and Lord and believed in their heart, that you would draw them to yourself. And may they not neglect or reject, but may they receive you whose infinite matchless grace exceed all of our stains and sin. To the uttermost, you want to save all who will come to you. And I pray as the elders and our tightest two women are here at the end, that we might have the privilege today of pointing someone to you. And the rest of us, may we testify 
of your marvelous, infinite, matchless grace as we live in this world, which is what you left us to do. In the precious name of Jesus, we pray all this, and God's people said, amen. God bless you as you go.